All right, my apologies um, if I was just paused for just a moment. So we wanna tell you about a recent project about co-creation. But before I do that, I just wanna say thank you to all of the speakers today. The themes of trust and humility and listening pull through in our project. But one other theme that I've heard today that we haven't named yet is the creativity that people have brought to this work of research with and in community. So I hope you'll see a little bit of that in our project today as well. So um, today I'm wearing several hats. For the last decade or so, I've been researching trust. I'm also a partner at a firm called See What I Mean Consulting, where we help organizations with research, planning, and engagement. But the most important hat that I wear is that I'm the mom to 18-year-old twins, Marin and Vern, who will graduate from high school in 24 days, not that I'm counting, but they also have cystic fibrosis. So I wear all of those hats in this project, um, sort of from multiple sides of the table. So the project we're gonna share today is a project that's supported by the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. And um, while this project is really special to us, Co-creation isn't unique at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. That's something that Melanie and I are both really proud of. That's a method that they're committed to, and they're using that more and more across all dimensions of, of research, clinical treatment, um, and helping people be in community. So Cindy George, our colleague at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, who's a champion for partnership, what she likes to say about the CF Foundation is community means everyone. So the work we're gonna to describe today really isn't about me and Melanie. Instead, it's really the story of a bunch of advisors and community members uh, that we call Team Trust. I think some of them are on the call today. So if they are here, if they can shout out in the chat that they're part of Team Trust, we would really appreciate that. So now I wanna introduce my colleague, Melanie Lawrence. Uh, Melanie's a member of Team Trust. She's an advocate for people with cystic fibrosis. She's a gifted storyteller, and she uses that power to really create deep relationships and shared understanding. She's also deeply committed to shared humanity, which has been such a gift to me, and I'm so grateful to count her as a friend. So Melanie, please introduce yourself. Hi, Stacey. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, hello, I am Melanie Lawrence, and I am 42 years old, living with cystic fibrosis. I participate in a myriad of committees um, aimed at, at improving healthcare on the backside. I work with the nonprofits, um, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and the CF Learning Network. Both are national nonprofits that have been exemplary in like listening and utilizing and um, megaphoning patient voices. And not only do they do that, but they give the community voices just as much credit and credibility as the clinician voices. So they've really been exemplary there. Um, I also have work, I am on my patient and family advisory board at Boston Children's Hospital, where they also really do a wonderful job of hearing our voices and, and including us in the conversations. And I think we have, we're gonna put everybody to work by asking you a question. Um, uh, in front of you, you'll see several images, all in alphabetical order. And I want you to think about which picture symbolizes how you want your care providers to partner with you. Take a second to look at the images, and then if you could, we're gonna um, show you a poll in a second, and we'd like you to vote for which letter corresponds to the picture that you would like your providers to partner with you. I think we can go ahead and launch the poll. The poll is on the screen, so I'd love it if people would answer. Melanie, I'm thinking this is a cool thread with the photo voice presentation um, earlier today. Actually, it is. Yes, I did photo voice, and it was an amazing experience, I have to say. All right. I bet I, the poll could I close. I can't see the poll, yeah, so you're going to have to <laughs> show me. I think we can close the poll and see the results.
All right, Melanie. So it looks like about 10% of folks pick picture A, the doors. About 7% picture B, the roundabouts. 2% um, pick picture C. Nobody pick picture D. 12% uh, pick picture E and 7% pick picture G, but 62% of folks pick picture H. So oh, interesting. H was two thirds of the audience. What do you think Very about that? Very popular um, and, and sort of predictable. Um, could any, could any, would anybody be brave enough to put in the chat which picture they chose and why? All right, some people are putting in the chat. They're, they're saying, um, oh, I love this. I love the symbolism. It's a hard choice. Somebody said food is essential, growing food and nutrition. Another person saying H represents nurturing. H because it represents growth of my relationship with my care team. So a lot about nurturing and growth. All good answers. Yeah. And, and it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I just wanted to share that I participated in, in the, well, you created this tool, Stacey, but I helped you test it uh, as part of a working group. And I took this piece of paper with all of these pictures on it into my clinic visit to see my pulmonologist. And I asked him to choose which picture um, represented partnership to him. And it was really interesting that he really opened up to me in a way that he hadn't before. And he chose the lighthouse picture F. And he said that he gravitated to that picture because as a healthcare provider, he hoped to serve as a beacon of light and hope amongst the, the healthcare crises and storms that come and go in chronic conditions and with chronic illness. So I thought that was really quite beautiful and poignant. Uh, Melanie, that story gives me goosebumps every time that I hear you tell it. And I think one of the things that maybe goes understated um, about co-creation is that in addition to learning interesting things and bringing new resources to our communities, we often have very profound experiences when we're part of the testing. I think the photo voice example had the same feeling. Um, so, you know, Melanie had this interaction with a member of her care team who she's known for a long time and has a great relationship with. But this tool, when she was the tester, gave her a chance to deepen that. And I recently just had a very similar um, situation with a different tool we were testing and my daughter was testing with her care team. And there was a whole kind of discussion about um, decision making. And as a person sort of on the brink of adulthood, you know, how that shifts. So I think that the uh, when we test these things, we don't just move the process along, but we can be transformed by them. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about, um, by the way, the chats are totally amazing about people's read on the pictures. <laughs> and we've heard so many interesting stories over time about who picks what and why. So when we think about developing tools with our community, this is the process that um, I'm really thinking of. And I have to tell you that uh, it is a good picture of what we do, but it is totally inaccurate. Because if you took that middle line and sort of moved it around and moved it up and down and it went back and forth, that would be a much more accurate point of view of what the process really feels like. And I think you've heard that from other folks today that it has to be led by community. And sometimes that means we back up, we go forward. So um, for this project that you're seeing, the picture tool, we sourced ideas from some research that a team had done about uh, people's experience of care, people with CF and their families, their experience of care. And we looked at every time that they talked about trust in their experience of care surveys. And we realized that people trusted their teams and there were so many positive comments about that and they told us why. But this other dynamic happened that when people talked about working together, they talked about trusting their team and about feeling trusted by their team. So that the idea of partnership happens when we both trust the folks that are helping care for us and we feel trusted by them. So we knew whatever tool we used had to really put that working together in the middle. So um, when it, now we have Team Trust, which are, is our advisory group, and they are always the first stop then for any of our um, first ideas. And so 
That's about 25 folks from around the country that are from all parts of the CF community, people with CF, parents, um, care providers, and also researchers are at that table. And we we just take things to them. We do it with them. They give us the feedback. We are often on the wrong track and they get us to the right track. And so they're really helping us in the co-design stage. From there, we go into that simulating with identifiable groups. And what I mean by identifiable is we're looking for folks who have sort of already raised their hand in the CF community, um, that they wanna participate, that they're excited about participating. And so in this case, we took the tools out to the patient family advisory boards. And we went to two advisory boards in two different places in the country. And we put we put the picture um, activity in front of it. It actually had different pictures because we had some problems with some of the pictures in the testing. And we did the activity with them, we simulated it, and then we asked them for feedback. And in that first group, there are three things that I can remember really clearly. One is I played the doctor in the simulation, the one of the advisory board members here. And I had like the script about this big where I was talking to them about, this is why we're doing and all of this. And when we got to the feedback, people were like, I don't need to know all of that. I just need to know that you wanna be better at what you do. And that was like so helpful to just know what was most important. Um, one of the other things that we learned is that um, in that first meeting, we tested three tools and the other two failed. And one of the other prompts was called, I want, I don't want. And it was very on the nose, right? That would be what a care provider would be asking somebody like, what is it you want in this care partnership? What do you not want? And we used a survey methodology where we had all these emotions listed. So when you see this activity or you see your friend going through this activity, what do you feel? And that I want, I don't want produce lots of words associated with nervousness, worried, anxiety. And it was just too vulnerable. And that was one of the strengths of the picture this tool throughout the testing is that people could dial up or dial down the vulnerability because they give the answer and then they say why. And that can be a big description or a little description. And we also found out we needed to have a couple of pictures that a lot of people would really feel comfortable with, like the plant, like that's one that feels comfortable to a lot of people and the doors but then providing a variety. The last thing we learned when we did the simulation, well, not the last thing, but the other thing I wanted to tell you about is that people were very sensitive to when this would happen. They didn't wanna do it when they didn't feel well. They wanted to be asked whether this activity would happen. Um, and they, in some cases, there was a lot of specificity about um, the time in the visit, like not too late in the visit, not too early in the visit. So we learned not just about the how, but a lot about the when and some about the who that um, you already needed to have in some cases uh, a positive relationship happening or at least a neutral relationship so people could feel like that was gonna be authentic. And the care provider needed to know how to follow up. So if you said doors or you said something really meaningful like the lighthouse, like how do you follow up on that next step? So the tool was one part, but how you surround it was the other part. And I'll just mention before I ask Melanie to talk about her experience being part of projects like this, we went to testing, um, we asked our advisors and folks um, who were part of the community to test that. So in this case, in the picture tool, there were um, 26 instances when clinicians did this live with real folks in their clinics. Um, and there were five different centers that participated in this. These were primarily centers that had already signed um, into being part of a program called a Partnership Enhancement Program. So these were folks in the CF community who were all really excited about the idea of partnership, looking for things that might advance that. Um, and how we tested it is they, uh, we sent them actually just short videos to the care providers and said, this is, you know, this instructions for doing it. Here's things the simulators told us to do and not do. Um, and then we were able to ask them, here's a quick survey to take. And they didn't, the provider didn't just answer the questions. They asked the other person, the patient or the family member to answer the questions too. So um, we were getting both points of view in most cases. And we were, there was probably some limitations to that about people, what people were willing to share. But then um, we thought that was a really helpful way to get that feedback back. So I think the last green bubble that I just wanna mention is that when we're doing the testing with identifiable groups, and even sometimes the testing in clinic, um, we recognize that it's not, does this tool work? It's for whom does it work and when? 
So we've taken a really deliberate approach to go out and look for populations that are probably not listened to enough and not engaged enough in the previous rounds of testing. So in the tool we're working on right now, that's a little different than picture this. Um, we went to a group of dads. We understood that we weren't listening to enough men uh, in, the, in the process up until that point. And so we asked our advisory team to help us find a group of dads to test out the tool. And they certainly did have a different experience with the tool that's now uh, really shaping that. So that's the quick story of the process that we have um, tried to refine and keep improving and some of the things we learned. But I wanna turn it to Mel to talk about what, it, what it's felt like to be part of it. Thanks, Stacey, for that rundown. Um, it, to answer your question, it has been exciting and an honor and very fulfilling to be a part of all of these research projects and testing and developing. Um, I think that it's been amazing to see the process um, from conception to fine tuning to delivery. And I think that it's been a big learning point for me that it's not just about getting the data, um, having a question, getting the data to answer it. It's been so much richer than that and so much more depth in that it's inspiring clinicians and caretakers to think about things differently, to see the patient community with more of a human lens, to see us more as holistic people who have lives outside of the illness. And I think that that wouldn't happen necessarily if they didn't have all of our feedback at the at this development level saying, this doesn't really work with our community or this doesn't sound right. This doesn't feel so good. Could we tweak it a little bit? I think that it really has been such a fulfilling process to work with such amazing people who want to change and improve healthcare. And so now I'm gonna put everyone to work again. And I am going to ask you to do some thinking and think about, you know, if you work for an organization that hasn't necessarily brought the community voice into the fold or given them a seat at the table of development, what is holding you back? What is making you hesitate about co-creating with more community members and stakeholders in the community? And then please put your answers in the chat. And Stacy, I can't see the chat. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, there's a person that wrote, one thing that's holding them back is the systems that are already in place. So what kind of thinking do you have, or uh, maybe when you've run into that in the past, Mel? There, I mean, I think every system has its strengths and weaknesses. Um, I think that you have to, it's bold and it's uh, visionary to go around or outside of the box of traditional thinking. Um, and I think that it's necessary for, you know, if you want change and innovation, you have to be willing to step outside of, of what's comfortable. I think one of the things we've realized um, in the most recent project too, is that sometimes when we say to people like, here's a tool, maybe you want to try it. They anticipate a lot of resistance or a lot of problems, but when we can get people to actually test it, they often can fit it into the system. And so, um, you know, the picture of this activity on average took about five minutes, uh, was what our testers told us. But I think if you'd show it to somebody, they might say, I don't have time for that in the system of care we have here. I barely have time to ask the health questions I have to ask. But when we could actually get the prototypes happening, we really learned which systems were going to be in the way, and there are some, and yes. which ones um, were more difficult. And what? I just want to I just want to elaborate on that because I think that's really important, Stacey, is that I like I see you clinicians, and I know that you're overworked and you have these bound institutional binds and insurance constrictions. And I see you, I know your job is hard and that adding anything to it can feel like, really? You're asking me to do more with little and little, like less and less time. And that is very valid, um, but it does changes how, I think you have to be am like amiable and flexible and the, the juice is worth the squeeze, not all of the time, but most of the time, something good comes out of it.
All right, Mel, we have lots of ideas in the chat. So um, let's see, one person wrote um, that, um, let's see, sorry, there's so many good choices. <laughs> I don't have like-minded people willing to work for me. I'm not, I have not been asked to work on a research where I get credit for my work. So that's one. And I think there's another one about kind of the personal dynamics. Like, I'm not sure I'm up to the job. So how do you think about sort of the personal and the, the group dynamics going on here? Well, I do think healthcare is a microcosm of the real world and life itself. So these are all very real issues that we face in life and at work. Um, it's it's hard, but I think that there are work around, workarounds. Um, for the person who didn't have like-minded people, I would say, you know, there has to be at least one person that you can get on board and then work around the work around it that way, finding just one person or one patient, or maybe, I don't know, Stacey, what do you think? That's a tough one. Yeah, I, I sometimes um, think about we uh, think about how much authority we have in a lot of settings. And we might not have a lot of authority in some cases, but sometimes we have some opportunity. So if you're responsible for X part of care, maybe you're the person that, you know, welcomes people and helps with blood pressure checks and those kinds of things. You know, you could practice asking new kinds of questions because you already do that. You already ask people questions. So I think the um, that's one way to think about not just where do I have authority, but where do I have opportunity? And I think the other thing is where do you have influence? So who um, among your group of peers, and I think especially if you're a care provider, who among your patients or your patients' families are really excited about this? And how could you work together on it? So for example, I took the picture activity to um, one of my kids is in a clinical trial. So I took it to the clinical trial folks. And I was like, hey, um, can we just do this thing while we're sitting around waiting for all these tests to be finished? And so we did that together. I just used my opportunity and influence sitting there as a mom for several hours. And they got excited. And then they actually used the picture activity in a different research project to learn more about how people perceive being asked to be in a clinical trial. So I think um, maybe just starting smaller you know, looking for like, can I integrate a new question in my practice? Can I be more explicit about asking about trust and partnership? Can I, you know, ask one patient to partner with me on this? So I think sometimes we try to go really big, but most of these projects have smarted, started really small and tried to gain momentum as we go. Very well said. All right. Let's see. Mel, there was one about just like the practical part of, um, like you're, you might have a grant that includes uh, your community, but the timeline is like, you know, too rushed. And then there's another one about the time of people in the community. I think this is one we've talked about. Sometimes we don't do this because we don't want to burden people in the community. So I might think, I don't want to ask Mel to help with the presentation today. She's, she has a lot on her plate just to take care of her health. So how do you think about the issues of time? I think there's a fine line and a difference between um, consideration and assumption. I think it's considerate to be mindful of my time and my treatment burden. But to be honest, this is the type of, um, this is something I'm very passionate about. And it fills my bucket in many ways. It gives me purpose. It helps me feel like I'm not only paying homage to all of a CF community that came before me, but I'm also laying brick by brick a better road for those to come after me. So for me, it this powers me up. It feeds my soul. And yes, it is. It can like if I have my hand in too many projects, it can get time consuming. But isn't that for me to decide, and for you to give me the opportunity to decide? So it says. Um... Sometimes there's a lot of rapid turnover. So you lose your champions and have to start over. And I know Mel, you've been involved in several projects with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation that have taken quite a long time. So what do you think are the keys when someone leaves or maybe somebody new moves in? Like what are the best ways to get people on board? I'm the opposite. They can't get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but we do have, I have worked with other committees and groups where patients have had to jump off or roll off. 
And my advice for that is to stagger the process. So it's not like a met, like to always have com uh, more than one community member involved so that there can be overlap and transition. And so when one rolls off, you still have another voice to lean on while you fill that voice with somebody else. I love that. I also think that from a facilitative um, perspective, um, every meeting almost of any kind has to start with that reminder of where we are in the process. And so I think that's why this little bubble diagram, well, it's not um, totally accurate. Whoops, sorry about that. That's our facilitator's agenda. Well, it's not totally accurate. It does help people understand like, where are we in this process? Because I think that it can be, um, you, you need the group of people to see that you're making progress. And sometimes the feedback loops can be really, um, can take a long time and make you feel like you're starting over again and again. So I think it's important to be able to show people you gave this feedback. We heard this feedback from this advisory board. We made this change. Then we go back to the advisory board and say, hey, we made this change. Now we're thinking about X because of what you told us. What do you think of that? But every um, time we meet, we have to do that regrounding. And I think it doesn't just bring the group along. It reminds us of why we're doing it. So we really love images um, that can help people know where they are in the process. Um, I heard some of the other speakers today, you know, really profound commitment to commitments to values that ground us. So I think any of those things that you go back to again and again and again can be really helpful in keeping the process moving along. All right, let's see, Mel, I think that it's time for you to offer. Oh, I have one more thing before we go to closing comments. See if I can get this to move forward. So if you want to get in contact with us, um, you can see our contact information here. We would love to talk to you more about it. We've also listed Cindy George, who is with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, who we work with very closely on partnership work. Her colleague Chandler Swope is on the call today. Um, but if you're looking for a champion in partnership and engagement with and for the community, uh, she is a wonderful person to talk to. Melanie, how about some words to take us out? Thanks, Stacey. So I know that not everybody is comfortable bringing community members into the co-creation process um, and the early stages. So I know I am empathetic to that. I know that it's not what most clinics or institutions are used to and that what we're familiar with is what feels safe and that change can sometimes feel a little bit scary or apprehensive. I think that it's important to remind um, all the clinicians on the call that you bring medical expertise and you bring a certain skill set to the table, but that it's an incomplete equation. That we, the patients, are we also have like an equal level of expertise with our bodies and with the illness that you are trying to treat or and or research. We are the ones living every day with the illness. We are the ones who are implementing your treatment regimens and suggestions. We are the ones who are trying to have a normal life in addition to the illness life. And so we are the experts of our bodies. We are the ones with the boots on the ground. So I think that by giving patients a seat at the table with you and helping to create together really gives an opportunity um, for equity, for shared value. And I think that's what really inspires change moving forward. Thank you, Melanie. I think we're going to pass it to Tracy, right? Yeah, that's great. Thank you.